thoughts people came up with over the over the break that you wanted to have straighten out about innate ideas here with Locke? If you want a sense in which Locke was very influential, after he wrote this book, um, at the, I should put it this way, at the time when he wrote the book, lots of people believed in innate ideas in England. After he wrote this book, the English-speaking world became very skeptical of innate ideas and widely has rejected it. Meanwhile, people on the continent in Europe, like Descartes and Leibniz and Spinoza and some of these other folks, were so influential that people on the continent were very sympathetic and encouraging of believing in innate ideas. So that was a big intellectual divide in the two. The people on the European continent embracing innate ideas. The British reject them. And for the most part, the, their, pro, their intellectual progeny, us Americans, are very skeptical of them as well. So this takes us then now from book one to book two. Book two is now the positive account of his view of knowledge. So if you think about it this way, book one is the is just saying what is not the case. It's a negative account. It's not the case that ideas come innately. So what he needs to do now in book two is give us a positive account. Where do the ideas come from? This is called his account is called empiricism. And empiricism is the view that the most fundamental source for the origin of all of our thoughts and ideas come from experience. And this is supposed to be a contrast with the rationalism we've been looking at that would come through Descartes and Leibniz. Descartes and Leibniz taught that the most fundamental source for our ideas comes through innate reason. Locke, no, experience. I'm going to break this up into groups and we're going to answer some questions. All right. Um, I'm actually not going to answer these directly right now. We're going to go through most of these through what follows next. If there's anything that we want to talk about with these, stop me and make sure that we talk about them. Um, I hope that this group work also helps you find ways to realize that some of the readings to some degree, not in every way, you can make sense of if you spend some time on them um, and, and working with them in, in a group like this. Um, so Locke tells us that the source of all of our ideas, and on his view of empiricism, I mean like absolutely everything that is in your mind comes through experience. That when you're born, you are born with nothing in the mind, completely a blank slate. And then through your experiences, you fill up that slate with stuff. And it's almost like, they use the example sometimes of like a wax tablet. And what the empiricists would even seem to say is like, you're born like this plain wax tablet with nothing on it. But literally as you have the experiences, the, the experiences imprint on your mind. He uses that word imprint a lot. Like it's like pressing into the wax and forming the ideas in your mind. So that your, your experiences almost uh, like press upon your mind. Um, all these new ideas. Now he says that there are two sources of experience. One is sensation, the other is reflection. Um, what, somebody tell me about sensation. What, is, what does he mean by sensation? I don't know, you just took up our paper. Yeah, Vince? He refers to the senses, we perceive the senses. Yeah, so sensation refers to what I, I will call it outward experience experience from sort of the outside of yourself, and we most commonly associate this with our five senses. Um, the idea is that you get through things by the way that they look, smell, taste, touch, and so on. Um, and so that's one kind of experience, that's the kind of experience we most correct, we identify with, I think, most easily. What's this other kind of experience he talks about? Reflection. Exactly. 
Um, they di it directs it, it directly relates with sensation, except it's more of a, like it's an internal thing. It's how you experience those senses and how you um, act on them. So this would be, like you said, it's an internal kind of experience. And maybe another word that we might put this is it's like an introspective experience. It's not the experience of things on the outside. It's the experience of your own thoughts and ideas. And, and I would go on to add feelings and other things like this into here. So that Locke would say, here are the two ways that we get new ideas. One, we get them through outward experience. And secondly, we get them through reflection and this sort of inward experience. This inward experience, reflection is needed because we have ideas about things like ideas. How do you know what an idea is? You don't experience an idea with your five senses. Well, you get the idea of an idea by reflecting on what's going on in your mind. Um, like I said, I would put into this also things like feelings. How do you know what happiness is? Or how do you know what um, depression is? How do you know what hunger is? All of that, I think, would also come from reflection. You don't really get those from an outward sense. You get them because you, ex you have those ideas because you've experienced them. Any questions about sensation and reflection? The, if Locke is right, the beauty of his system is this that you get all of your ideas. Everything that is in your mind comes from these two sources, and that's it. So it's a very, in a way, I mean, elegant and simple system. You get everything that you know, either because you experienced it, or because you reflected on that, and through introspective ex uh, experience, you, you know what that is. We could... Looking through this part of the text, this might be a little artificial, but I think there are two arguments for empiricism that we can derive from this. So one of these comes from section 5. This is actually in the bottom half of that paragraph or that section about children. This wasn't the primary thing I wanted you to take out of that paragraph, although it's something you could take from that um, when I had you do that in your small groups. So Locke says... Um, these, when we have taken a full survey of them and their several modes, combinations, and relations, we shall find to contain all our whole stock of ideas and that we have nothing in our minds which did not come in one of these two ways, referring to sensation and reflection. So what, basically, what does that mean? You cannot find an idea that did not come from experience. So here's a way you could falsify Locke's theory. Can you come up with some idea that did not originate from experience in some way? Is there any thought that you have that cannot be traced to an experience? Let me ask you, do you think Locke is right about this? Or can you come up with an idea or some thought or something in your mind that is not traceable to experience? What would Locke say about the idea of God? We will read about the idea of God when we get to this part later. The short story is, he wants to say that we derive our idea of God through experience that you have the idea of persons because of your experience, and then you just sort of say God is like a person, but more so. You know, he's more powerful, more wise, more good than any of you. So. Yeah? I know we're going to read on this, but what, like, the idea, what if God isn't a personal being? Then you would, whatever you think, whatever concept you come up with God would once again have to be derivable from these other parts of your experience. If you say... Do you think God is like a force? So usually that the model for an impersonal God would be like a force. Say, well, maybe you've got some idea of force independently, and then you extrapolate other qualities about force and say that's what God is like. Other thoughts? Uh, anybody come up with anything else that might be difficult, or you're just curious how he does it? Yeah. Is experience like that can be an indirect, you could be like indirectly experiencing things. Like let's say you have a fear of being attacked by bees or mm -hmm. something like that. You didn't experience that, at, you never actually were, were attacked by bees, but like maybe you saw it in a, a TV show mm -hmm. or something like that. So is it like an indirect experience that yeah. caused you to think that so way? So if like you read a story or saw a movie or something like that, maybe there's a sense in which uh, you sort of get 
certain ideas through reading or through experiencing a movie or something like that. You would be fine with that. Okay, so it doesn't have to be necessarily a personal experience. It could be, like, it doesn't actually have to happen to you in that sense. Like, it could be right. an indirect thing. Okay. I mean, in a way, when you read a really good novel, it causes you to have a little bit of those experiences or the feelings and the ideas. Um, you know, when you read a really good story told in the first person, um, you almost feel, you almost, you almost go through those same experiences as that character. And even, so you might get like nervous and scared when the character is nervous and scared. So that would all be consistent with what Locke is saying. Um, the second argument, this is actually what I would was saying about the sex on the child, so I got that mixed up in my mind. So this is the end of that thing on the children in section six. Um, Locke puts forward this kind of thought experiment that says, imagine that a child were kept in a place where he never saw any other but black and white until he were a man. He would have no more ideas of scarlet or green than he who from his childhood never tasted an oyster or a pineapple has of those relishes. So what Locke is kind of saying here is that if you had a child who was capable of seeing colors, but for whatever reason was just only exposed to black and white, that child would not be able to conjure up in his mind like the color red or green until he had the experience. Um, the same thing would go for somebody who, suppose you've never had pineapple, or maybe you know somebody who's never had pineapple. Do you think that they could just conjure up the idea of what that tastes like if they've never had the experience? Most likely, I would say the answer is no. Somebody who's born blind, do they have the idea of what a color is? Somebody who's born deaf, do they have the idea of what sound is? It seems like what Locke is pointing out in all these, in, in these kinds of cases and the ones I'm adding is that experience is necessary for having certain ideas. You take away the experience, you take away the ideas. That seems to make a very strong case for saying, where do the ideas come from? They're coming from experience. So for these kind of two reasons, you can't come up with an idea that you can't trace back to experience. And secondly, it, <clears throat> it certainly seems like you need to have the experiences to have the ideas. This is building a stronger case for the way in which um, experience, his view of empiricism is right, that you need to have, that experience is the source for all of our thoughts. Now there's this interesting part that takes place next where um, Locke starts talking about dreaming. You might be saying, what's going on with all this? We're going to hopefully bring that full circle at the end of this section here. Um, Descartes, if you remember, believed that the essence of the mind or the soul is to think. But Locke says the soul doesn't always engage in thinking. This is one of the, the questions I had for your groups, which is to kind of go into why doesn't Locke think... So why does Locke think that the soul doesn't always engage in thought? Um, if nothing else, it seems like we can have a dreamless sleep. Periods where... We literally have no thoughts at all. It's just nothing. So what Locke would say is that thinking is not the essence of the soul or the mind. That's what Descartes said. The mind's essence is to be a thinking thing. But somebody like Locke is coming around and says, well, if that's what the essence of the mind is, then the mind would always have to be engaged in thought. If the mind wasn't engaged in thought, at some time it would cease to be the mind. So... Instead, Locke says that thinking is just a power or one of the abilities of the soul or the mind. But it's not the essence of the soul or the mind. If there were the essence of it, it would always have to be doing it, and it doesn't always do it. Um, this leads to an interesting puzzle about personal identity, this, this thing about Castor and Pollux. Maybe before I get to Castor and Pollux, were there any thoughts about what he was saying about uh, the soul or the mind may not think. This is also going to be a topic of one of the uh, women philosophers that we're going to look at later in the course.
So Locke says, suppose one person while awake has certain ideas. When they go to sleep, their soul has certain ideas, dreams. But the first person, he doesn't remember any of these ideas. So what does Locke want to say about this person? Um, what is going on with this business about, about all that? Yeah. It's two different people. That's right. He wants to say that the person who is awake is not the same person who is asleep. Um, there was like a TV show. I, don't, I never watched I don't know what happened to it. Where the premise of the show was like one, one person has certain experiences when they're awake and then when they go to sleep, they have experiences like of being a completely different person. Um, and then, although the weird thing with that one is that, the, that he remembers both. So imagine what would happen if when you go to sleep, someone, like, there's a whole nother consciousness, a whole nother train of thought that takes place that is um, disconnected in, from your current consciousness. Locke is going to say, well, then there's two different people. So, um, let's, let's go ahead and take a look at this passage here. Um, this is on 326, 327. Um, Alright, so he says, For it is altogether, this is starting in about five or six lines from the bottom, For it is altogether as intelligible to say that a body is extended without parts, as that anything without being conscious of it or perceiving that it does so. They who talk thus, thus may, with as much reason if it is necessary to their hypothesis, say that a man is always hungry, but that he does not always feel it, whereas hunger consists in that very sensation as thinking consists in being conscious that one thinks. If they say that a man is always conscious to himself of thinking, I ask, how do they know it? Consciousness is the perception of what passes in a man's own mind. Can another man perceive that I am conscious of anything when I perceive it not myself? No man's knowledge here can go beyond his own experience. So what is, um, you know, what is he saying here about, um, actually, did I read the right passage here? Why did I have this page about all right, now I'm getting curious about what I was doing here. Oh, I know what I'm probably meant to do. Sorry, what I probably meant to say is it's the it's what's the spans the columns on 326, um, or maybe I meant anyway. Now, sorry, it's, this is where my notes can drive me a little bit off the the right path. 12 is about um, on page 325 yeah. bottom of that column. That's what I want to talk about. I think it's 325, 326. I'm not going to read all this again because I don't want to <laughs> go through all that again. But in your groups, many of you looked at this thing. And the point here is that if you have one consciousness and another consciousness that are disconnected from one another, that don't remember each other, that's like having two persons. Yeah. Kind of like schizophrenic. Like schizophrenia is like dual personality disorder. In a way. If it was kind of weird. It's like you don't remember well, I mean, I don't know about every case, but like there'll be like one person in one moment and then their brain like switches them over to another person. Like and if the two people don't interact, if the two minds, if you will, the two personalities have no awareness of one another, then I mean it makes perfect sense that they're two persons. Yeah. That's what Locke would say is the natural and obvious result that he thinks is actually the right result to say here. It's the other person who's saying, no, it's one person here that has a harder case. So what he's, what he's saying makes the same person across time has to do not with having the same body. We're going to see this later. It's not being the same soul, but it's having the same consciousness. We're going to talk about that when we read, I think, this part 359 to 367 next time. More on this later. This is really, I think this is one of the more interesting and exciting parts of Locke's philosophy. That's kind of cool. 
So what I just read actually in, ended up reading aloud was this business about saying, well, the, the soul does not, the soul may not be, it's, how do you know that you're not having thoughts all the time? So one of the things that, that Locke would say is that you can't prove that we're having thoughts all the time. And in fact, he would go so far as to say, when I look at my own experience, I catch myself quite often just having no thoughts at all. You ever just been sitting there, like, you know, eating your dinner or something, and you know, this happened, like, you're on a date or something, and, you know, the person you're on a date with says, what you thinking about? Like, <laughs> Uh, uh, nothing, you know, and you're like, you know, b being honest, like, isn't that, doesn't that happen? Or are you constantly thinking thoughts? Is it always the case that you're, you have a thought before your mind? You ever been sitting in a classroom and then teacher calls on you and sort of like, whoa, I wasn't, I didn't have any thoughts, I was just kind of like, you know, in a daze. Is it possible for you to have no thoughts? Locke says not only is it possible, but it's actual. And if nothing else, just thinking about the idea that you could be in a, in a sleep where you don't have any dreams would prove that you can go into periods where your mind doesn't think at all. And can't you argue that meditation would do just that? I mean, you repeat a mantra over and over until your thoughts aren't there and you just Exactly. I mean, especially in the East, I mean, this is the whole point of meditation is to try to empty yourself of all thought, and certain people claim to achieve that. So, you might, first of all, this is, this relates to Descartes, right, because we all know Descartes' famous claim that what makes the soul what it is is that it thinks. If Locke is right, then that proves Descartes wrong, which is that the essence of the soul must not be to think. It must include more things, because the soul can exist even if it's not entertaining thoughts. But why does this relate to Locke's empiricism? Well, the key thing here is that it shows that the soul is not generating new ideas apart from experience. This whole business about sleep that takes place here and dreaming is all to show that you're not secretly like getting new ideas while you're dreaming or something like that. He wants to say, he wants to sort of guard against any possibility that somehow you're like secretly getting new ideas from your mind when you least expect it. All right, let me pause here for a moment and just say, any questions about this or any of the group work you just did that I did not address? Uh, I actually, we were just talking about this in our group. Can't, the, I know we were going to like Descartes, can't you just say that if you're not having thoughts, then you just cease to exist during that time. You could, but this is the thing, is Descartes doesn't think that, like, you're... He thinks of your soul as a <coughs> substance. So that means that you're, you're... The substance, it's not like the substance, like, pops into existence and then pops out of existence. So if you... If you want to say, well, you just cease to exist, then you'd have to have the idea that you're... That when you're... When you have... When you cease to think, not just that the soul is, like, turned off, but that it like ceases to exist altogether. And then when you start thinking again, it like pops into existence. And Descartes doesn't want that. He wants the soul to be there all the time. Okay. So, it, but in a similar thought process, not exactly Descartes, could it, could, could it not be contradictory? You could do that, <clears throat> in which case you have a now maybe another task, which would be say, is it the same soul every time? If it's always falling out of existence and coming into existence, is it the same one or not? And if you say it's not the, if you say it's the same one, you say, oh, how can it be? It's being constantly destroyed and created anew. Right. And if you say it's not, then how is it like entertaining the same ideas? Have it, there, why is there this continuity of thought that can take place still? One of my students in another class where I'm teaching this got really upset. Well, not upset, but she ar was arguing pretty strongly in Descartes' favor, saying that, you know, contemporary psychology actually bears Descartes out, saying that, you know, people are dreaming even if you don't remember it, which is the sort of thing that Locke was saying was, like, impossible. I don't know if anybody feels strongly about that in here. Yeah? I would probably agree with that, uh, because 
psychology, you would say that the mind is always processing or thinking or doing something, and it's never just completely inactive, even during sleep, even in like the deepest sleep. So I guess that would, that's where I kind of got hung up a little bit when it came to the argument of sleeping and no conscious thought happening. Well, I was going to say, don't we only dream during REM sleep, <coughs> stage four of the processes of sleep? So what's going on in the other mm -hmm. stages of sleep? Anybody, and how do psychologists know that we are dreaming when we don't remember we're dreaming? So you're right, I mean, there's just, you, one thing to think about is that maybe the dreaming only takes place in certain stages, but, uh, I mean, how do psychologists know you're dreaming? Well, it seems as though what Locke would say is, he, he kind of, in the definition that he uses of things, it requires, um, it requires that one must necessarily be conscious of the different perceptions within, like, the idea of being able to think. So it just kind of seems contradictory to having thoughts and not being conscious of them. It seems like, his, by his definitions, it was, yeah. yeah. So by his definition, to have a thought is to be conscious of it. So that very idea of an unconscious dream or an unconscious thought is a, is a contradiction in itself. Although, I mean, if you really pressed him on this, he just would have to say, well, maybe if there was conscious awareness of dreams, but you don't remember it, then that's just a whole other person having it. It's not you. It doesn't help you learn anything through your dreams, if that's what we're trying to talk about here with innate ideas. Yeah. I think if you if you side with the whole psychology says that um, even if you're not conscious of it, you're dreaming or you're sleeping, then I think you would have to look at the psych like or yeah the psychology behind meditation because that could save this argument because that could be an example of one. There's no thought. It'd be very interesting. I had no student has actually brought this up before, so I haven't thought about this much myself. But that I think would be a very interesting study. Yeah. Let's go ahead and take uh, a little break here. Yeah, all right. Oh, well, I could ask that. Please. Let's come back and pick up that thought, and then uh, we'll be back when the clock says, let's just say like seven thirty. Let's say seven thirty-seven. Okay.